Nicholas Parsons' many contributions to the entertainment of the nation are so extensive that they cannot be summarized in just a minute, with or without hesitation, repetition, or deviation. He has been an outstanding contributor to radio and television for over 70 years and continues to do so with remarkable vigor and mental agility at the distinguished age of 92. A career in entertainment was not, however, what might have been predicted for him when he was born in 1923, the son of a doctor and a nurse in Grantham, Lincolnshire. A little deviation is irresistible here. His father's practice also cared for the family of Grantham's other famous son, the future Margaret Thatcher, though sadly the story that Dr. Parsons delivered the future Prime Minister is apocryphal. So the stage was not in Nicholas's blood but he knew it was what he wanted to do from the age of five. Unfortunately, when he expressed an interest in acting, his parents revealed what he has described as a neurotic dread of a dissolute thespian life. Perhaps they were also influenced by a concern that he would not succeed, as he had a stutter and, although this wasn't recognized at the time, was dyslexic. His subsequent successes on stage, radio and television are therefore an even greater personal triumph. With these disadvantages, when war broke out in 1939, the 16-year-old Nicholas was taken away from St Paul's School in London and, since he had shown some skill with his hands, was dispatched to Glasgow as an engineering apprentice in the robust environment of the Clydeside shipyards. This was undoubtedly a culture shock for a well-spoken, public school-educated Southern boy. But with hindsight, it may have been the opportunity he needed. In school, an ability to make the other boys laugh had won him friends, even if it sometimes led to a caning. Now he found that his sense of humor helped in his communication with the Glaswegian engineers, once he had managed to understand what they were saying and it gave him an independence he might not have had at school or at home to take part in amateur concert parties specialising in impersonations. Nicholas studied briefly at Glasgow University but did not graduate, though he finished his apprenticeship and qualified as a mechanical engineer. It is a pity that the university's engineering students are not graduating today to see this demonstration of the diverse careers available to them. Spotted by impresario Carol Levis, Nicholas's first professional appearance was on a radio talent show. With the ending of the war and with the very reluctant acquiescence of his parents, he moved from apprentice engineer to apprentice actor in repertory theatres in the southeast. He made the first of many British film appearances in 1947. To his regret, though offered a leading role, he had to settle for a minor part as he was not released from his stage commitments in the West End. Regular work on the West End stage eluded him initially, but his versatility was demonstrated by success on the London cabaret circuit and later as a stand-up comedian, including at the Windmill Theatre, famous or notorious for its living statues, where a dancing girl's body was concealed by fans. As Nicholas has pointed out, more was revealed to the rest of the cast backstage than to the gentlemen in the audience. But it was a considerable challenge to amuse those gentlemen with a comedy act while they waited impatiently to be titillated. This summary passes over many other stage and radio appearances, but it is fair to say that our honoran's career really took off when he formed a television partnership as straight man to comedian Arthur Haynes. Their show was the com ITV comedy triumph of the late 1950s and early 1960s, leading to Royal Variety Show appearances and the Ed Sullivan Show in the USA. The partnership was dissolved shortly before Haynes's premature death, but by now Nicholas was a star in his own right and was able to fulfill his childhood ambition 
to play the lead on the West End stage, starring for 15 months in the immensely successful farce Boeing Boeing. This too was the age of TV satire, and Nicholas pointed out to the BBC that radio was being neglected. This led to the pioneering weekly show, Listen to This Space, which he devised and which won him the award of Radio Personality of the Year for 1968. And so we come to Just a Minute, the radio panel game which Nicholas has hosted for an astonishing 49 years, outstripping even Roy Plumley's tenure of Desert Island Discs. In over 900 programmes, Nicholas has managed and engaged with some of the most talented comedy stars the country has known. To name a few, Derek Nimmo, an earlier honorary graduate, Kenneth Williams, Paul Merton, Stephen Fry, Giles Brandreth, Sheila Hancock, Graham Norton, and Sue Perkins. The length of its run and its sustained popularity, a testimony to the quality of the concept, but equally to the skill, warmth, and generous spirit which Nicholas has brought to the program, as to so much of his life. He further demonstrated his talents as a host on the TV game show, Sale of the Century, a program which he came to regard as a professional albatross and which ran for the relatively short period, by his standards, of 14 years. But there is much more to Nicholas Parsons than these shows. There have been appearances on Doctor Who, three seasons in the Rocky Horror Show, and 15 on the Edinburgh Fringe, to which he returns this autumn. He was elected rector of St Andrews University, a role he found very rewarding. And his work for children's charities such as the Lord's Taverners, Childline and the Variety Club was recognised in the award of a CBE in 2014. It is also very much to his credit that he is a lifelong supporter of Leicester City Football Club. Nicholas has said that his profession is not one from which you retire, it retires you. In which case, after 70 years in the profession, we can anticipate many more years in his company. Mr Chancellor, on the recommendation of the Senate and the Council, I present Christopher Nicholas Parsons that you may confer on him the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws. Thank you so much for coming. Your smile lights up the hall. Thank you very much. Yes, guys, you have taken it. He has taken it off your hand. You can keep tapping until I get there. Right. Um, Chancellor, Vice Chancellor. Professors, lecturers, undergraduates, graduates, and all these lovely people here, many of whom are about to become graduates. May I say right from the start what a joy it is to be here in Leicester, and how flattered I am, as well as um, am delighted to receive an honorary degree at this distinguished university. I must thank also Paul Cesarge for his incredible and comprehensive uh, account of some of my work, so most of which I did recognize. <laughs> and uh, he was done his research very well, and it was a great pleasure to listen to it. I have a great affection for this wonderful city of Leicester. It is unique in many respects. I think it is, in the British Isles, one of the most multicultural cities that possibly could be. And they show that in every area of their work and activity. And it's, it's a proof that multiculturalism really does work. It's a great credit to this wonderful city of Leicester. <laughs> you may have heard that I also support Leicester City Football Club. And you heard in the address from the uh, pr principal and vice chancellor how Leicester City started off with the most incredible odds, but finished up at the top of the Football League, which is a complement to the dedication 
of the players, the comradeship within the players, as well as one or two distinguished outstanding players. But also, Leicester is a wonderful city for sport. You have the, not only the foxes there, but you have the tigers. You know, and they are doing so terribly well. And then, of course, there's cricket. Leicester County Cricket Club, which I've also supported as a, a cricket enthusiast and buff. And there's other, many other distinguished uh, sporting triumphs have come from this amazing city. It, it is a joy to be here. The last time I was here, actually, was earlier in the year when I was part of the Leicester Comedy Festival. Did anybody see it? No, all right. <laughs> I'll have to come back again. It's part of Dave's comedy night out or something, or something like that. But it was a great success, it was a great joy to be here. And uh, I've been asked to uh, finish uh, by saying a joke, because that is what I'm associated with. I do make a living uh, being humorous. And, um, and have I got time for a joke? <laughs> so um, I, I do a show, which I do a rather country, two, two hours actually. But one of the jokes that I tell frequently, to the extent that my wife says to me, you're not going to tell that one about the brigadiers, are you? Because she's heard it so often, she finds it difficult to ask again. But it is a classic story. It's about four people in a railway carriage. And I was in that railway carriage. It was before we, you know, when we had these lovely old-fashioned railways with compartments and corridors. And these four people, suddenly, they were all British, so nobody said a word for about 200 miles. And then a conversation began. And one of them said, you know, it's very strange you should say that because I happen to be a brigadier. I'm happily married, I've got three sons, and they're all doctors. So the chap in the second corner said, you know, that is a most amazing coincidence because I also am a brigadier. Happily married, got three sons, and they're all dentists. The chap in the third corner suddenly said, I, 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 I really cannot believe this coincidence because I also am a brigadier, happily married, three sons, and they're all solicitors. The chap in the fourth corner was quiet for a bit, and he suddenly said, well, I suppose it is a funny coincidence, but I happen to be a sergeant major. I am not married, and I've got three sons, and they're all brigadiers. <laughs> I think we've got some more degrees in there. What about Chancellor? One more? Or sit down? I'll do exactly as you say, you're in charge. One more. I, um, we used to live in Gloucestershire, and I loved it, the countryside there. And uh, you know, the people there uh, have this idea that those country people are not quite as bright as the ones in the urban areas. They're often much shrewder. We had a wonderful baker called Jack. And I remember one time to get our usual loaf and he suddenly produced a huge pair of tongs. And I said, Jack, what, what, what's all this in there? Went, I said, well, it's the new, uh, new rules, new E. coli po poisoning and all that, he said. You know, mustn't touch the goods by hand, you know, hygiene, do you understand what I mean? So I got these big tongs here for the bread and the loaves, like, and I got the little tongs for the buns and the cakes, like. And I said, yes, but you've also got a piece of string hanging out of the front of your trousers. Ah, he said, that's all part of the hygiene. Because when I'm on my rounds, you know, delivering the like, and I get cut short and have to rush into the bushes and make myself comfortable, that's where that bit of string comes in handy. I undoes the zip, pull on the string, and all very hygienic. <laughs> I said, I know, but I mean, how do you put it back in again to the trousers? Oh, he said, easy. I use the small tongs. <laughs> that applause, I will quietly retire to the seat I've got over there. But let me finish by saying, as I look at all these wonderful, exciting, expectant graduates to be, what a joy it is to see you. I once sat there, I've been a rector of a university, and I know what it feels like. And you're all looking so lovely, so smart, all dressed up, and all the mums and the dads and the family and so forth, all so excited. It's a great day. Just remember this. You heard some of my history. It was a tough start. Climbing up the slippery, lavish show business in the most tough and unrewarding pressure in the world. Follow your dreams. 
And if you give up and you're heard from your principal, you've got to go up. And don't be disappointed, don't be disillusioned. If once you aim for something, it doesn't happen, try again. Because with the degrees you've got, you will have a big advantage. And there is a lot of advantages out there. There's a lot of unemployment, but there's still plenty of work for those with your talent and with your ambition. So good luck to you all. And it's a joy to be here. And thank you for listening to me.